The title of our sermon this morning is The Wandering Years. And our text is from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2. Remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness. The plan seemed simple enough. Leave Mount Sinai, journey toward Canaan, and then enter it. But it didn't work out that way. When the Israelites learned that they would have to fight their way into Canaan instead of having it handed to them, fear gripped their hearts and they refused to enter it. And so from the grand narrative, the storyline that is so familiar to us, as a consequence, they ended up wandering the wilderness for 40 years. Now, we might be tempted to say, well, I wouldn't have done that. When those 12 spies went in and the 10 came back and said, there's no way we can do it, three months into the journey in the wilderness. We might say, oh, well, let's listen to Joshua and Caleb, who said, we can do it right now. But before we jump ahead, we need to remember that there is no version of the Israelites escaping from Egypt and going straight into Canaan. They spent 40 years in the wilderness, and so do we. So I'd like us to think about that because we tend to think of wandering in the wilderness as a negative. So I want us specifically to think about wandering and then in the context of wandering in a wilderness in terms of its spiritual significance. So this term wandering comes up in the scriptures a number of times. There are individuals mentioned in scripture wandering streets, wandering through the fields and forests, through deserts. And then, of course, famously, the one we remember is in reference to the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. So first, a word about wandering. Spiritually speaking, it means to not know what truth and goodness are. To not know what truth and goodness are. As to our spirits, we may feel like we're going in a specific direction, but as to our spirits, we are wandering the whole time, sojourning. And I want to make clear at the beginning here that to not know something, to not know a truth, or to not know a goodness, something good from the Lord, is not a crime. Ignorance is not a crime. So we can start to think of wandering as this, carrying this idea of discovery. It could mean that when we wander, which we all do, and we track and follow that of the Israelite journey, that in this wandering is this process of discovery, learning things, for example, that we didn't know before. It could mean struggling with a new idea. It could mean changing our opinion. Or it could mean letting go of bad ideas. So that's a little bit about the concept of wandering in terms of its correspondence. What about wandering in the wilderness specifically? Well, here, when you look at teachings that describe that, we're told that it corresponds to being carried away into various eras. And this kind of fits the terrain, if you think about a wilderness, a desert, it's barren, it's empty, it's dry, it's harsh, and inhospitable. And so we get these teachings that say, well, a wilderness is a state of obscurity, a state of ignorance, and the key or leading idea here is that we have a limited sight of the truth. 
And then we get the specific teaching which you heard today that says the travel and the wanderings of the Israelites in the wilderness represented their temptations. Another word for temptation is struggle or trial. We'll get more to that in a moment. And of course, the temptations in the wilderness remind us immediately of the Lord himself, who frequently went into the wilderness and experienced temptation. So I'd like us to think about wandering having a purpose. We typically think of it as being directionless or pointless. And so let's just exercise some muscles here for a moment. Wandering can actually be quite therapeutic. Go for a walk. Yeah, we may have a destination or a route in mind, but there's something nice about just being able to explore or travel. Wandering in the woods. I put this one down because this is an ongoing struggle in our family, letting go of the need to reach your destination at a certain point in time when traveling on a trip. If you have a spouse that likes to stop and say, hey, let's go check that out, and you're looking at your watch, no, 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 we don't have time for that. So this idea of being a little bit flexible in terms of the wandering. So I'd like to suggest that it's a necessary process. First, because here we have in the storyline the fact that the Israelites wandered for 40 years in the wilderness. Something, there was a purpose to this. There was a function. There was a use. Wandering in the wilderness gives us a time to sort things out, notice contradictions, explore things that don't make sense. And this is really important if we think of our life in this world as life in the wilderness, if we're tracking this whole storyline. Entering Canaan, there's lots of passages that say entering Canaan is to enter heaven, is to enter the full state of regeneration. So most of us spend our adult life in the wilderness. But again, let's think of this in the way that you would if you lived in Arizona or other parts of the world, that when you get out in the desert, it's not as horrible and dry and barren and hot as you might think. There is a beauty there. There's life. You see certain kinds of wildflowers, lots of things as you start looking closely. We read about this this morning where the Lord says that we are like fruit as yet unripe, to which shape and beauty and flavor cannot be given in an instant. So as a result, we are given by the Lord during these wilderness years, these wandering years, to think much about eternal life. And so to think about the truths of faith, but because we do so from proprium or self, we cannot help but wander into this position and then into that one, both as to doctrine and as to life. So this whole journey had a purpose. It actually had a direction. It was pointing people in a direction. And here's a really important thing to think about wandering. I'm going to show you in a moment two pictures, and we can think of wandering as being aimless and pointless, going around and around in circles. But in the case of the Israelites, we're told so clearly that they were not wandering in the wilderness on their own. The Lord was guiding them every step of the way. So this is the way that we would like our journey of life to go, from point A to point B. Just a straight arrow. I know where I'm going. Does this represent the way life unfolds? Or does this 
represent the way life unfolds. I see you smiling, which means it's the latter. I was struck recently by seeing a picture, a diagram of the London Underground system, and it showed two diagrams side by side. It had the one that you see when you go down into the underground that has these nice, clean, straight arrows, green, red, blue, depending on the line, all the stations, and they're nice and straight. That's where you're gonna go. The other diagram showed the actual routes, the routes of those trains, and it's like spaghetti, all the way like this. Imagine if that were what travelers were showing. Get on that train, and you're gonna go all over the place, but it'll get you to your destination. I don't think many people will travel the underground. This is what our life is like, if we were to put it into diagram form. <clears throat> The reason why the Israelites' journey in the wilderness was not pointless or directionless was because the Lord was leading, and we learned that within the first three months of their time in the wilderness, Moses and the Israelites were given by the Lord five tasks or wilderness tasks, skills that they could develop. They were given the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, Moses was. They were given food and water during those harsh conditions. They were given combat training. They were given Jethro's advice, and they were given instructions for building the tabernacle. Let me just briefly recap what happened in each of those incidents, but the thing that's so fascinating is that these provisions, the Lord providing, the Lord setting up a wilderness life in which the Israelites would have guardrails, a way to keep them on track, happened within the first three months. Forty days, Moses was up on Mount Sinai, where he received the Ten Commandments, as well as the instructions for building the tabernacle, the portable worship center for their life for the next 40 years. When they were dying of thirst, and had incredible hunger pains. They had the water from the rock, water was provided for them, they were given quail at night, and then they had this substance, the manna, which they didn't even know what it was at first. And so you get this idea of the Lord providing. And it's so important for us to realize as we go through the journey of life, to realize that the Lord provides, and he gives us things like manna that at first we don't even know what it is. We don't realize how nourishing and how important it is for our journey. Each of these things could be a sermon in itself, but the combat training I wanted to mention because as the Israelites traveled along, there was an enemy. There were lots of enemies. The Amalekites were the particularly pernicious ones. The Amalekites would come out and ambush the whole caravan of Israelites as they went from camp to camp and they would pick off people at the end of the caravan there, the column. And they were a terrible, terrible enemy to fight against. And we're told spiritually that that pictures uh, the way evil spirits work to pick off different types of things within us and, and antagonize us and, and drag us down. And so this idea of getting combat training in the wilderness or fighting or using the sword of truth, using the Lord's truths to battle those attacks and defending each other. Think of how much right now we need to support each other. There's Jethro's advice. Jethro was the father-in-law of Moses, and that's another story. I'm sure you're familiar with it. There's Jethro watching Moses handle during the day from sunup to sundown thousands and thousands of people lined up to come bring their various challenges to him. And Jethro says, this is not right. You need to divide this work up to, with captains of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Break it up. Make life easier. 
cut your problems down to size. And then the beautiful instructions for the building of the tabernacle and the opportunity that the Israelites had throughout the wilderness years to be able to worship, to be able to get that focus, focus on the Lord. So in general, these five wilderness tusks transformed their bleak, dry, barren surroundings into a landscape that was full of hope and promise and meaning. Yes, the conditions were harsh and difficult and sad at times, but it also kept them focused and busy and useful. So this brings us to the topic of temptation or the, top, the, the subject of struggles, which we come back to over and over again. Why is there so much suffering that we experience, that other people experience? Why does it have to happen? Why do we go through so much pain and hardship? The Israelites clearly had their fair share. And it's a question of purpose, function. What is it all doing? What's the point of it all? What is the purpose of these struggles? Well, our reading today gave us a surprisingly simple and refreshing answer. It is so that we may be strengthened, strengthened in our resolve to embrace all that is good and true and noble and kind. And the interesting and important thing here is that these qualities or loves are something that only the Lord can plant in us. So the overarching purpose of the wilderness journey, the wandering years, signify that under divine guidance, we are led by means of temptations to a firm acceptance of the truths and goodness of faith. Now, that sounds very technical. So let's think about our own lives and think about, well, what is the point here? What is the point of these struggles? Okay, so it's to get us to strengthen our resolve, to strengthen our commitment to that which we believe to be true and good and from the Lord in His Word. I want to challenge you a bit. I challenge, when I challenge you, I'm challenging myself. Asking the question, well, what is it that you want? What do you want? And you can say that to yourself, what do I want? What, and you can say it to your children, your loved ones and your friends. Because truth be told, as we go through our journey of life, we are in this grand process of really trying to decide what it is that we want. It's not as easy a question to answer because deep down inside, we don't necessarily know what it is that we want or we haven't finished deciding. But again, as we go through the journey of life, as we go through these wilderness states, we do learn some important things. And we do learn through the trials and errors and the school of hard knocks that our lives do indeed become directionless and pointless and empty and sad if we replace God with our own God. That's something that the Israelites did straight out the gate. There was Moses up on the mountain and straight away they went back to the false gods. So we may not realize that we're doing it, but this was a temptation that the Israelites struggled with over and over again. They repeatedly wanted to go back to their old life in Egypt, to the promptings of the proprium or self. And I think if we're honest with ourselves, and I think as we get older, we do less of these forays, but the forays into pursuits of happiness, into what we think will make us happy, into what we think will make us peaceful. What usually happens is that they bring us right back to where we started, and we don't find ourselves any happier or peaceful or content. And so you have this theme developing that like that generation of Israelites, that wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, there are certain habits, certain behaviors, 
certain attitudes inside each one of us which need to die off before we can enter Canaan, before we can enter heaven. So I want to give you a one-minute exercise because you have all spent a long time in the wilderness already. And to think about that, what are these attitudes, these behaviors that need to die off in you? So we come back to our text. Remember, remember that the Lord your God led you all the way. We have these beautiful teachings that say, as soon as we recognize, quote, that under divine guidance, we are being led by means of temptations to conjoin or unite true ideas with good loves, that our wandering years begin to make sense. We see that our wilderness journey is preparing us for a, quote, a new will or conscience not yet formed. And what could be more delightful and more happy and more peaceful than to realize that the Lord is actually capable of giving us new loves, loves that we never had before, And these are loves that will truly make us happy and peaceful and content, not just in this life, but to all eternity. And it is truth, truth from the Lord's Word. Every time we go to the Word, we sometimes will see something different that we didn't see before. It's the Lord leading us and guiding us. Now you're ready to see that. You weren't before. Now you are. So truth is the means and struggles or temptations are the norm because, as this teaching says, a new will comes through the introduction of truth. And this journey in the wilderness for 40 years is being guided, choreographed, step by step by the Lord. So I may not be able to convince you to enjoy these wandering years, but maybe we can look at them in a slightly different way. First of all, we can look at our wandering years not as random or pointless or directionless, that there's a methodology behind it, and that the Lord is truly guiding us. Even if that diagram that we have looks like spaghetti, it's still going in an upward direction because the Lord is in charge. He's leading us and guiding us. And like the ancient Israelites, we can think about these five skills that the Israelites developed in the wilderness and think right now in this time that we're living in where there's so much heavy news and heavy and difficult issues that are hitting us from so many different directions. I'm going to read these five wilderness tasks again, and I'm going to invite you to think about what's one that I could focus on. The first one, following his law, the Ten Commandments. I think as we get older, we come to see those thou shalt not, not as a series of forbiddings, but a series of this is the way to true freedom. This is the way to true peace and happiness. And specifically, those, those t- two tablets of stone, one for the Lord and one for the neighbor. Ask yourself, what is the best way right now for me to show my love for the Lord and for me to show my love for the neighbor? What spiritual practice can I develop? Maybe it's trusting that the Lord will provide the food and the water that the Israelites were given. What can I do to be truly content and grateful for? What spiritual practice can I develop? 
Maybe you feel the need to be a warrior for the truth, that combat training. Who needs my help right now? Who needs me to stand strong next to them? Because we're all defenseless against the Amalekites, against the attack of the hells, and we need to join together. Maybe in feeling flooded or overwhelmed, you have a need for being able to cut your problems down to size. Jethro's advice can so easily be overwhelmed by the issues and challenges that face us right now. And we can say a simple prayer to the Lord. What can I do to put things in perspective? What can I do to cut things down to size right now? And then the fifth one, which was the instructions for preparing and building the tabernacle, cultivating a regular prayer routine, spending time with the Lord. Maybe that's what you need right now. So we've done a quick journey and survey of this grand journey, the journey of 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, seeing that it's not a pointless going around and around in circles, circles journey, but one in which the Lord is carefully leading us and preparing us for life eternal. And when you go back to the scriptures, it's interesting how this grand journey, the wandering in the wilderness of 40 years, pops up in different places, both in the New Testament and the Old Testament. And I'd like to share, in conclusion, these words from Psalm 107. They wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted in them. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. And he led them forth by the right way, that they might go to a city for habitation. Oh, that people would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wondrous works to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul and fills the hungry soul with goodness. Amen.